All right, so what we're going to cover today is going to be basically the four processes that we need to print. And so the first one is obviously that designer make. So you mentioned that you had used Tinkercad or otherwise, and that's a good way to start and it's a good way to kind of initial, but we recommend that's kind of more of like a middle school, junior high kind of start area um, for working with a 3D modeling stuff. So we kind of move on towards something called on shape. So that's O N shape. Okay. And that's free based online so all you need is like a web browser so you can actually run it on Chromebooks but in order to export the file or get the file out of the Chromebook you're gonna have to have a different type of computer uh, you're gonna have to have like a Windows or something that can actually move files back and forth between things. so that's a great kind of program to start with and it's a lot like a traditional CAD program so it's gonna be like you're gonna have planes so you'd have like your XY and your you know YZ and XZ and you would choose one of those planes and you would basically say, hey, I want to sketch on this plane. And then you'd create some object or some design or sketch or something and make it a closed loop. And then you extract it from there. So you, you're extruding the object out of that sketch and it's basically going to create that pretty model for you. So that's, that's the idea of a traditional CAD program. And so we have Tinkercad for kind of intro, on shape for, you know, medium kind of used to it users. And then Fusion 360 is kind of where you're going to be getting into like you can use a CAD design and you're not like uh, going to be super scared of all of the kind of stuff that's going on in the screen. So Fusion 360 has a lot of settings, a lot of different things you can do, but I do recommend it for if you're teaching high school um, just because it is free. You can have a free license for teachers and students um, and it can be collaborative. So it's kind of like shared on the cloud also and it has a lot, a lot of functions. So it's, I like it a whole bunch. Um, that's kind of like my preferred workspace. And so that's what I would probably touch on. But besides the design making and creating whatever object you may want, we actually need one type of file out of it. And so that's actually called a .stl. And so what that stands for is a stereo lithography. And basically what it is, is it explains a shape with triangles. So it would basically, if it, you were to take this face and it would separate this entire face of this into triangles. So if you think of that in like terms of a sphere, it is going to be like almost a tessellation. It's not going to be an actual sphere. It's going to explain it in flat surfaces, but it's going to be a lot of flat surfaces. So does that kind of make sense for you? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, I, I'd be lying if I said, oh yeah, I understood all of it. Yeah, that. of course. Uh, but it's a little bit different. And, and uh, you can kind of view that whenever you actually put the, the STL file into Cura. Um, you, you can actually see that it's kind of like, you know, different shapes that go around like a curved object. It's oh, like, okay. But, you know, if you have a rectangle, that rectangle is made up by two triangles. And so that's basically what it's doing. Separate yeah. thing into triangles. And you can, you can augment the oh, individual shape that makes up that entire um, shape or the larger. Yeah, so you can, you can manipulate it in all sorts of ways. There's that's like an in-between program. Uh, I like to use Mesh Mixer. That's a good one to kind of do that. But you have your STL file, and if you put it in something called Mesh Mixer, you can pull and push and move all. It's kind of like the SketchUp program on how you can, you know, you can step around like that. And, yeah, exactly. Okay. Got you. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. So we need the STL file from the design you're making, and then we move it into kind of the bigger deal with you know, moving to the printer. Before we get to put the file onto the printer, we take that STL file and we have to slice it. So we call them slicers, and the one that we're gonna use for our printers is called Cura, or C-U-R-A. And so hopefully you have like a little USB. Yeah. Sweet. And we're just gonna plug it out into the computer. All right. So it'll probably pull up a dialog box that says, what do you wanna do with this? Or if it doesn't, just go ahead and go to your documents, and then, here and we're going to actually go to the Cura folder inside that. So I'm going to go ahead and swap to the screen share so I can show you all the settings and stuff. And whenever I screen share, it might full screen for you. Um, hit the escape button, or if that doesn't work, uh, in the top kind of pull down box, you should be able to click on the dots and kind of select exit. All right. Okay. So what we're going to do is I'll, I'll explain this step through step. And so first we're going to kind of install it. So we're going to open the Cura folder here. And are you on a Mac or a Windows? So you're on a Mac? Yes. Okay. 
So you can kind of pull or drag and drop the .dmg to your applications folder so that it installs and then you can run it. And so that's just the base install and hopefully that, that'll work for you. I think it did it install for you kind of go. I mean, do I need to like, uh, how do I get back to my actual screen instead of seeing your screen? Yeah, so go ahead and go up to the top and there should be like this drop down box area and you should be able to click on like more and it should be, you know, disable full screen. Okay. Um, swap shared screen. I'm sorry, I've never, oh, okay. I don't know if that's right. I've never used any kind of anything like this where it's almost like a remote end video. Oh, you're fine. I mean, this this is a conversation. Think of it that way. So, like, if you have a question or something, stop me. Ask me. Well, I don't know. Like right now, I'm looking at the green. We're viewing Michael Allen's screen, and I go to Options Grid, and I don't see anything on that. I go over here to Zoom Pro account. Mm -hmm. I don't see the drop down menu that you're talking about using. So at the top, like if you put your mouse to the top, does it pull down a little menu? Um, I mean, the only thing that pulls up is like that I'm viewing screen is the only thing that pulls up. Okay, try and hit escape or otherwise. Oh, there we go. There we go. Cool. <laughs> That's really, really no matter than that. Uh, this dude, this dude. <laughs> All right. Well, that's all right. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to kind of talk about Cura. So once you kind of go through the install, so you'll, you'll click on Cura, and then just like you'd install any other program on a Mac, you basically drag and drop it, and then it'll kind of tell you what else you need to do. Like if you drag and drop that on your desktop and then click on it, it'll tell you how to install it. And then we're going to click Next. We do want to install all the drivers that it has. It kind of has check boxes, and you're going to click Next to those items. And then once you get to this screen, where it says add new machine wizard, I want you to tell me, and then we'll move on. Okay. So the DMG first, correct? Yeah, yeah, the DMG, right. Okay, um, I'm, I'm on the first time, so I'm just gonna go through it. And um, I'm at, what kind of screen do you have? I'm sorry? Uh, I'm at the point now in the configuration wizard that's asking what type of machine that I have. Okay, so you're at this one, select your machine? Yes. Okay, so what we're gonna do next is we're going to basically just select other. Okay. And we're gonna click next. Gotcha. And then we're going to click on Mendel. All right. And next and finish. And let's pull up our actual screen. Okay. Yeah, I'm doing the same thing that you are. Yep. Okay, cool. Give me just one second. I got this kind of like staying over my screen. Uh, where was it? All right. Well, so now you're at the same screen, right? Yes, that's correct. Okay, so we're going to kind of go through this pretty quick. There's a lot of information, so if you have any questions or anything, just go ahead and ask me, and we can go over it, and we'll talk about it a little bit more. But So we're going to start from top to bottom here in this uh, kind of first panel on the left-hand side. And so the first one that we have is going to be quality, and it's going to say layer height, right? So this does determine how nice your print's going to look. And so we say anywhere from 0 0.1 to 0 0.3 is a good range for so if you have it at 0 0.3, it's going to be low quality. If you have it at 0 0.1, it's going to be your idea of high quality. So we're going to leave that one at 0 0.2 because we're just doing a test print pretty much at the end of this. And now we're going to move on to shell thickness. So shell thickness is actually going to be the exterior wall of your model. So the models aren't completely filled with plastic. Instead, they have a certain amount of infill or durability to them and this determines that outside wall thickness and so for this one we're going to go ahead and just change that to 0 0.8 because we want it to be a multiple of our nozzle size and our nozzle size is actually 0 0.4 
So we'll change that here in a little bit, but notice it kind of turns yellow. It's telling it, us that it's unhappy because our nozzle size isn't quite right for this case. So if you have a shell thickness, you do want it to be a, a multiple of your nozzle size. So you could use 0 0.4, you could use 0 0.8, you could use 1.2, anything that's a multiple of four. Okay. And that's gonna that's gonna calibrate the, the rate of the extrusion coming out in that multiple then based on the nozzle. Right, exactly. It's basically going to make the walls a certain thickness, right? So like if you're going to have a shape that is, say we kind of take this box for example, right? If you can kind of see my screen here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. And take this box for example. This edge right here or this edge that is printing the side, it's going to make it at least 0.8 millimeters thick. And that's the idea that we're using right here. So it'd be two shells is what this is considered. So okay. 0 0.8 is two shells. If you were to 0 0.4, that'd be one shell of your nozzle. And then 1.2 is gonna be three shells. So it makes the exterior a little bit more durable and you basically have a, you know, a thicker wall. And it's com very compatible with the nozzle and it's easier to understand by the, the printer. I yeah. Okay. Okay, so the next one is going to be the bottom top thickness, and this applies the same kind of way with S shell thickness. Um, so we're going to actually change that one to 0 0.8. Okay. This is the exact type of what shell thickness is, but this actually determines the bottom and top of your model rather than the sides of your model. Gotcha. Okay, next we have fill density, and this determines like your durability of your print. So this is going to determine how much infill or the percentage of the object is filled with plastic on the inside. So it doesn't necessarily need to fill the whole thing with plastic. This is going to make it partial. And I'll give you a little demonstration of that here later when we load a model. In. But okay. in case, we like to say anywhere from 5 to 25% is usually a good fill density. So if you want it a little bit weaker, we're just going to put it at 5. And I'll show you how that changes here in a minute. Okay, I'll put it at 5 then. Mine's default on mine's 20. Yeah, so actually um, it is 20 and that's a good one for like having a durable print. But if you turn up the fill density, it's going to also increase the time of your print and how much material you're using. Okay. So next one, we're going to have print speed and print speed at 50 millimeters per second is a good speed for these printers. Um, you can go up to 60 millimeters, but that's kind of like pushing the envelope. And what can happen is it might knock your model loose and it might mess up your print or it's going to lower the quality a little bit. So if you do decrease the speed, it's more likely to make your quality consistent. So you could, you could lower it to maybe 30 to 40 millimeters per second if you'd like. Um, so it'll be more consistent. Like if you're trying to get a final prototype model, maybe you'd want to slow it down a little bit and increase the quality. You can do that. But we like to print it generally at 50 millimeters per second for almost every print is pretty good. Okay. Next one, we're going to have printing temperature. And we're actually going to use 220 degrees Celsius. And just because we had this certain type of plastic, so this is called PLA or polylactic acid, and it prints at 220 degrees because there's a composite kind of added into it that actually ends up making it more flexible, and so it takes a little bit more heat to melt it down. So the general temperature for PLA is 210, but we do it at 220. Well, I have, uh, well, my students and I have access, we happen to provide a chart that has filament top and suggested uh, printing temperature next to it of any kind? Oh, for like the, for the printer itself? Yes. Um, so you could, um, there are suggested ones. Um, as a matter of fact, like if you hover over the box here on printing temperature. Yeah, uh, PLA is 210, ABS is of uh, value Two. 30. Right, exactly. So it does kind of give you like an example of what you would use. Um, but we like to do 210, 220 for this PLA because it's kind of different. Um, probably the only thing you will be using in class is either PLA or maybe if you have like a flexible filament like TPU, then you would either do that right at 210, 220, same kind of range. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I would like to ask real quick, Michael, uh, since you're recording, will I be given a copy of this video? For you will. So this will actually be uploaded to YouTube as a private link, and I will send you a follow-up email with that link, and you can share it however you would like. That's awesome, man. That's a really good pro Okay, well, I'll stop giving commentary so my kids won't hear me and think it's annoying. <laughs> <laughs> no, they probably like it. All right. All right, so next up, we're going to have bed temperature in – the A5 printers do not have a heated bed, so we're gonna change that to zero. Okay. 
All right, next one we're gonna have support. And so what support does is like, if you have something floating in midair, so say you make a object and you have an arm or something and arms obviously don't usually touch the ground. So if you have that arm and it's kind of sitting up here in midair, it's going to print material, like wimpy, easy to break material below it so that it can actually print that in that kind of air idea. But it's going to print it on top of the sports and then it's gonna build up from there. So make sure that we don't print in midair and make spaghetti or anything. So we're gonna change that to actually everywhere for our first couple prints and kind of go over in that sort of thing, just to make sure that whatever print we do load into this environment, it does have supports if it needs it. Nice. Okay. And then we're gonna have platform adhesion type. So we won't need a platform adhesion type because this model is gonna be pretty small that we load. But what it does is if you have a big flat model, it helps to not warp. And so what warping is, is like the bottom of the model might pull, up the base. pull away from the build plate. Yes. And what that's going to do is it's basically going to make your model look funny or it's not going to have a flat side and it might not be the design you kind of want. And so this is a way to kind of help, you know, deter that. And so that yeah, happens so much. <laughs> so, yeah, so we recommend only using brim on that one because raft creates a lot of plastic and it takes a lot more time. Brim is less practice, plastic, but it's still a little bit of time, but it will definitely help. Okay. And so another way to kind of avoid the warping is to make sure that your build plate is level again. Um, leveling your build plate can often decrease warping. So that's just kind of another tip for that. All right, so for filament, we're gonna change this to 1.75 because that is the size of our filament. You can actually see that on the size of your, um, or on the side of your, spool and it's going to say PLA size 1.75 so that's what we're changing. Okay. Next we're going to have flow percentage and as optimal we want it to be at 100%. That's the idea is that of course all of our prints are going to be perfect so we'd run it at 100% but this is basically flow compensation. So like if you feel like it's not giving you enough material or it's too little or it's too much then you can always change this percentage value to kind of give you a little bit more, a little bit less of material. And then finally, we get to change our nozzle size, which is going to be 0 0.4. And that's just what this printer has specifically. And so there are different nozzle size to kind of use different types of plastic or different types of uh, filament. But for this case that we're just pretty much printing in PLA, we're going to use a 0 0.4 nozzle. All right, so that is all these settings for like, those are print settings, like what's gonna happen to my print whenever I load a model in. So now we have to go over one more thing, which is gonna be the machine settings. And this is specific for the A5. So if you had like a different printer and you plug it in and you didn't change the machine settings or make new machine settings for that one, then it's gonna be weird and it's not gonna work quite right. I have a question. Yeah. Is there any way that I can save these settings, kind of like how you can save a motorized seat in a vehicle, like setting one, setting two, where I could save all of these settings for like uh, one or two or something like that? Or do I need to change them each time before each print if they need to change? So you do not have to change them each time. So you can save them just like you said. You can either export a file or you can save them as a printer. Um, so each time you kind of go through here, you can actually click machine and add new machine, and then you can reset all of these settings for it. And then it, you know, it's a whole new profile for you to use. And so this is, this is technically user specific. So if someone else logs onto your computer, they're going to have to redo these settings. Gotcha. So you remember that if you're kind of going over a class with these settings and kind of talking about these, each person that logs on will have to do it. Uh, the first time, but if they log on to the same computer again and it's the same profile, then it'll already be set. So these settings, would they be saved? If I wanted to save these particular settings, would I save it uh, as uh, save profile when I click file? So yes. So if you click on save and you click save profile, okay. it's going to actually export it as a .ini, and that's specifically the profile that you have just created. So we're not quite done. So maybe not do that yet. Okay. Um, yes, you can export it as a file, but it'll save it just generically once we finish doing these settings. Gotcha. All right. Well, I'll, I'll just sit back and be quiet and we'll continue. <laughs> if we were to exit out of it right now and open it again, all of these settings that we've changed already will stay the same. Okay. Cool. cool. 
All right, so now let's click on machine. And so if you kind of see on my screen how I have a whole bunch of different printers just from trains. So that says A5, A31, A5. Uh, if I choose a different one, it's actually going to change these settings and the build plate area as, as necessary. Okay. Kind of the different settings that you can have. So if you wanted to change certain settings here, like you wanted to make a high quality print where you made the layer height zero one, you had a good fill density and you lower the print speed a little bit, and you can save that as like a different, you know, printer idea. So you could say A5 high quality. Right. Or final proof or something like that. Or right, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Good, because I, I need that organization for my students later on and, and show them how to do it on the front end and then, you know, have some we, – we can have the same login credentials on some computers where they'll know that, hey, I can use this computer, you know. Yeah, exactly. That would work. And even if you don't have that, then you can always export the file and use the little SD card you have to load it onto it. Okay. So right. Same place where you said, uh, you know how you said save profile. It also says open profile. Right. Open the profile and it'll load it in the same way. Great. Okay. Okay. So now we're going to click on, oh, not add new machine. I don't want to do that. So we're going to click on machine settings. So we're going to click on machine in the top toolbar and gotcha. machine settings. Okay. okay. We're going to change the width, depth, and height. So we have a five by six by four inch build plate. So this is going to be 125 or right around five inches. So the maximum width is 125? Yep. And then maximum depth is going to be 150. Okay. And then maximum height is going to be 100 or about 4 inches. 100? Yep. Okay. And then we don't have a heated bed, so get, go ahead and unclick that. Gotcha. And then all of these settings over here on the side should be zero. And then we have auto, auto, and square, and rep wrap. And we're good to go. Got it. So you can change the machine name here. So you can say, you know, this is an NWA 3D A5 medium quality. So if you wanted to kind of save it as that form. And then we're good. A5. Yep. So it's a called an A5, right? Gotcha. Got it saved. Awesome. And then we click OK and we should be good to go. And so let's load a model in right now. So you probably have a robot already. Um, so I'm going to take you through the steps of just kind of like loading a new model. So you'd click file and load model file, or you can click on this load here in the box screen. So this little folder up here with a little hourglass, you can click here or in file, load file. I think I just accidentally clicked out of for a second to do that. You're fine. All right, All right. I'm back. I'll load, load model file. Yep, and then we're going to navigate to our SD card. Okay. And then let's click on STL files, because remember, once we make a design and we export it, we're going to export it as an STL. Now, so, now what does it start out as when, before you export it as an STL? Does it have a name prior to being STL? So it, it does, depending upon the program that you made it in. So Tinkercad doesn't really save it anywhere besides in its, like, online library. Right. So it really have a file type, but you do export it as something, right? Okay. Uh, so, like, if you're using Fusion 360, it would probably call, be called a part or an IPT or something similar to that. Um, basically, they're going to be part files that make up whatever the assembly or otherwise was. Gotcha. Um, okay. It's specific for the CAD program you use. Yeah, so that's why we don't really mention it kind of thing. Because there could be any number of them. So. Right. Okay. I'm on A5 files, uh, A5 spool holder, keychain, six-sided dice. Yeah, so which one do you want to do, the keychain or the dice? I think dice would be cool. Cool, let's do it. So if you double click on that, it's going to pop it into the build plate. And so you probably already have a robot. So if you want to get rid of your robot, you can right click on them and click delete object. Gotcha. Oh, there's while, all we're in that, while we're in that menu, we actually have a couple other things. So we can like center the object on platform. We can multiply it or split it into parts. And then we can do that for kind of all of them. Okay. This is kind of like a, a thing to remember if you're trying to like get the thing back to the middle, but you keep like only moving it and you're like, I, I'm not sure if that's the middle, just right click and center. Um, I don't know if this is necessary for you to know. You may already know the answer to this. Uh, my printer is not connected to my computer that I'm using right now since I just loaded the video conference. Yeah, that's absolutely fine. Okay, all right. So we actually don't have to connect the printer to a computer. Nice. That's what the SD card is for. So we actually can put the little micro SD that we get out of it into the printer when we're ready to. Um, you can connect the printer to the um, to the 
computer if you would like to. We just don't like to because if the printer falls or if the computer falls asleep or if it's like disconnected or bumped accidentally or something, it has a likelihood to stop a print. Right. So we have the SD card in it. All that has to be plugged in is the printer and the filament, and it's good. Good to go. Awesome. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about Cura. So if you click, left click on the object, it's going to pull up these three little things in the bottom that are going to be rotate, scale, and mirror. And so those are pretty self-intuitive. So when you click on rotate, it's going to give you like three axes that you can, you know, manipulate in order to move the object about. And this would be something you would use to like lessen the amount of support material you're making or put it at an angle so that the bottom of the object ends up flatter or something kind of like that. Where's okay? So yeah, it's the first beaker looking icon. Okay. Yeah, it's the beaker that says like rotate and has the circle going around it. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then you can lay flat or you can reset it as it was, and then you can kind of move. Will this affect how it's how it comes out of the extruder based on what angle it's it's set at for you print. Yeah, so it will. So like if I put it at this, whoop, hold on. So let's reset that real fast. And if I like put it at an angle like this it's going to change how it prints. So it'll actually print at this angle, right? So it's going to print at this 45 degree angle, but this shape, it probably wouldn't be a good thing for this shape since it has all these other flat sides. Other right, things. exactly. And so that's the idea where you want to manipulate your sports to lessen the time and to make it a little bit easier for it. So it would have to actually make supports right here where it's not touching the build area. Okay. And so, you know, if I rotate it back this way, then it's it's going to lessen the time. So it went from 15 to 12 minutes to print it. So that's a way to kind of move your model around and see what's best for it. Gotcha. Okay. And then we're going to have scale, which is, uh, you know, we can, you know, proportionally scale it so that it's like double the size if we type in two here. So this is actually percentage on the top one. Um, and then we can scale it, you know, separately in millimeters. Or we can, you know, unclick uniform scale and we can actually edit the object entirely, basically. Now, are these proportional? Like, if I move one, will it move all the others in a preset fashion? Like yes. Okay. And Unless you unclick this lockbox here that says uniform scale. Okay. And then if you click that and then you pull one of them, it's going to kind of like, it's going to mess with it. You have free reign on individual items and it won't affect other... Right on the design okay so i'm going to go back to one so that it's 100 percent scale or regular and now we can you know you can also set it to max or reset it um those are the next two options above the one we're at so two max is obviously going to maximize it to the build area so the reset if i go on here and uncheck the the lock box for uniform scale and really mess everything up and i'm like oh my gosh i really screwed up and i go to reset and it would take it back to all of its original uh, values that were in these boxes yeah so for instance if you see mine i kind of really messed mine up uh -huh. right so that's obviously not a cube anymore <laughs> right. and i click on reset perfect okay. awesome okay, okay. Yeah. and then to max is going to make it the maximum size of the build area gotcha that's what my you know when they're exploring i want them to explore with that but then when it's like okay i gotta get back from the rabbit hole i'm glad that yeah. you reset and it takes it back to everything like it was before they started yeah it makes the life a lot easier so if i maximize this cube it actually is going to take 10 hours and 30 minutes to print well that won't be a bad deal uh, it won't be a problem next year when we can hopefully buy three at one time you know yeah so the good good thing about that is that you can you know do a certain you know instruction with your class or otherwise and then you can manage to print off everybody's models in time to do like a presentation or whatever it may be with it because if you only have one printer and each print's going to take you know, at least five hours, then that, that time adds up really fast. You have 25 students and each of them wants to print a five hour print. Well, that's a lot of time, you know, that's a hundred hours. So well, if I have enough spool or enough uh, filament on the spool, whenever I have the SD card into the printer, will it continuously, it won't, I'll have to clear it off before it can start the new one, right? Right. So if it finishes a print, all it will do is the printer will like move to the side and it will cool down and you just have to move the print off of it. So, and then to move the print off of it, you can again, just click on it and hit print from SD and create a new print. Would it be possible if it didn't take up all the plate to like tell it for print two, print, you know, X number of space over from where print one was. So that way it could just, you know, start filling up the plate. 
Yeah, so watch this. I'm actually going to do the right click and click multiply, and I'm going to add five in here, right? There we go. And hit OK. And so it kind of spaces them all immediately, but you can move these as you want. And so I can like move this over here if I wanted these in the print. I wouldn't have to individually move these off once the, once the print is done based on how they were in the space before you moved them. Right, exactly. So it, it's easy to kind of scrape them all off at once kind of thing, you know. May I ask you another question real quick? Sure. Um, if, I, if I want to, can I load multiple designs into one uh, print job on one plate? At the same time, I'm putting multiple ones in there. You sure can. So notice I kind of put this one, next one in the keychain, and it's yeah. gray right now. So it's basically saying it's not happy. You can't print where it's at. So I would need to move it over. So when it's yellow, it means it's happy. Okay. And so it'll move. It'll move things out of the way. Do it to match. Like at the end of the day, if if I have eight print jobs, almost like what you have on the screen. Well, that's what you have. Okay, good. If I have eight different print jobs and they're all scaled to fit and will work when printed at that size as well, you know it'll work for whatever purpose it's being printed for yeah that would be a way to maximize one printer it is yeah that's a good way to maximize it and you'll definitely need to do that kind of thing okay. um, so, up here in the top left it's actually going to tell you this is going to take an hour and 40 minutes and it's going to tell you how much uh material it's going to end up using right and so this is going to use 16 grams but you have a one kilogram roll so that's really not a lot of filament not really. No. Okay, good. Is there any way for it to know how much I have left throughout it or do we just need to keep track of that based on? Um, yeah, you can keep track of that if that's something you want your students to do. Um, but generally, like you can kind of see it. You can kind of see how much is almost gone. Right. Uh, I mean, like, we get, say we get almost, we don't know if we have a quarter of the school left and then it needs to print like 0.27 kilograms how would we know if we're about to start a print job and we have enough on our current school to complete so the you can you can actually weigh it and that would be a way to tell okay. if you have a scale or something you can always weigh the spool and i think the uh spool itself like the outside plastic is like half a kilogram and so you just subtract half a kilogram from it and it'll tell you how much you have left okay so the the black pieces on these is half a kilogram yeah, I'm pretty sure. Uh, I can double check with you for that, and I can send it in the follow-up email. That might be too much information, but you know what I mean. We don't want to start a print job and not have enough filament to finish it when it took. Certainly, right certainly, hours. yeah. So I can really understand that. Yeah, I'll I'll order us a scale, a digital scale, then so we can scale this before we print. Okay, so I'm going to delete all these objects because there's a whole bunch of them, and I'm going to load back in the dice. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay, so now that we kind of talked about all that, we have one more thing over here and then we can actually save it. Uh, so let's talk about the view mode. And so view mode is gonna have a lot of options, but there's one that I really wanna highlight and it's called layers. So when we call this a slicer, this is really what it's doing. So it's actually creating a tool path for your nozzle. So when I click on that, you notice this blue line, that's the tool path that it's gonna move across. And then it kind of makes the model different colors and stuff. And so whenever I take this and I scroll through it, it's going to show you all of the layers that it's going to take. And so if you kind of take that slider and move through it, this is one of the layers that it's going to print, and it's going to print a total of 80 layers to make the object. Dude, that's awesome. Now, when I click on uh, view, what – did you click on layers? Yep. Okay. Click on view mode and layers, and it's going to give you this view. Now, how do I, how do I get to where I can, okay, there we go. I got my bird's eye view now. Okay. Yeah. And so if you actually right click, that's how you kind of move around your camera in this and it's going to help a lot. Oh, that, okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Now I have a oh, free will and Bob Dylan. Okay, good. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. And then you use the slider here on the side in order to move through it. And so in this case, you know, I'm going to show you kind of how the fill density affects this. So we're going to go from five to 25% here and it'll regenerate it, and now look how much of that yellow material is on the inside. Gotcha. So Whoa. you can do that yourself to get an example of it? Yeah, so that's kind of the fill density that I was talking about earlier. It gets you a visualization. Man, this is like a time lapse. I could have kids use this and be like, you know, kind of preliminary troubleshoot, you know, like before you print, like- go Exactly. To, you know, scroll down and scroll up and make sure it's getting the layers into it. Yeah, make sure everything looks like you want it to look as it prints through it. Mm -hmm. And so this is a perfect thing for that. Yeah, this is a perfect way to kind of troubleshoot at the start from Cura. Right, that's what I need. I'll teach him to do that. Because I have seventh, eighth, and ninth grade in my particular class. 
Sure. Yeah, I they'll do great. Like if you're using Tinkercad or Onshape, I think they'll be fantastic. That's what I told them. I said if you really like this and interested in it, and you want to learn more and you're good at it, you'll get burned out on those two programs in about two weeks, probably. You know. Yeah, yeah. It's you know they learn so fast that they yeah they're gonna have that. Exactly. That's why I told them. I've already told them to be keeping in mind what other ones you want to use besides that. Mm -hmm. Grow intellectually. Okay. Yeah, definitely. And. and 3D modeling is something that they can get used to and, and get good at it fast. So would my a 3D Maya be able to uh, be compatible with the files that can be printed on our printer? So pretty much anything that exports at an STL is good. Okay. Gotcha. So anything that kind of exports into that STL file, you can load into Cura. Also, if it's a dot OBJ, that's another file type we can use. Um, dot OBJ is just store a little bit more data than STL files. So, all right, kind of have the program. We have it like we wanted. We have our printer settings done, machine settings, and now all we have to do is save the print, right? And so we either click toolpath to SD, but I'm gonna go up here and click file and save G code. So G code is actually the toolpath language that the printer is gonna use. So that's our second file type. So we have STL and then the printer uses G code. Okay. So click save G code and I'm gonna save it in the main file of the SD card, so I'm going to go back one and go into there and click save. Gotcha. Okay, it's going to save it, and now all we have to do is eject, so we can close Cura. We're done with that. I have one question real quick on Cura. Yeah. I, it seems like I'm using the right click, and I'm only, right now, I'm only able, to, do I need to exit out of the layers before I can rotate my view on the print pad? Or the no, print you should screen? be able to rotate it on layers. Well, I, I can't seem to, I'm using the right side. Oh, hold on. Oh, so I have to fix those. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. For the touch, for the touch pad, it's kind of hard. It helps to have a mouse for this kind of thing a lot. Gotcha. Well, I'm, I'm rotating around. Like, it's cool. All right. I got figure it out. Thank you. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So now we save it and then we eject the SD card and we're pretty much good to go. Gotcha. So eject the USB. And so that was, that was the second step, right? We sliced it. And the third step is going to be transfer or moving it from a computer or a slicer program to the printer. Um, so let me stop my screen share here real quick. Okay. So what we're going to do now is now that we kind of have, you know, our little USB and there's a small SD card in the back of it, right? And so we can actually pull that out of there and that's what goes on the printer. The step of transfer. So that goes right to the printer and it's right below the button, like right here, you have your big button and I can swap these real fast. So we have our big button right here and it's going to go directly below it. It's a small little slot next to a little micro or next to a... Okay, I see it. I see, yep. it. I see it. And you should hear it click into place. Got it. Sweet. And once we kind of click that in place, that was our transfer step. And then the only thing we have left to do to print is to click print from SD and that's it. So that was the entire process of design, slice and transfer and print. So those are the four steps, right? Yes. Would you mind uh, telling me in a nutshell, layman's terms, what slice actually means? So you notice how we went through those layers? Uh -huh. That's what slicing means. Okay. So it's going to be like each layer that the printer is going to go through, right? So this layer, and then I have this layer. And it's basically telling the printer where it needs to go to create those. So you, is, is that more of a review process for the person that's wanting to print, that's designing to make sure that their layers are as they should before they print? So you actually have to slice it. So like if you don't slice it and you try and put an STL file on the printer, it's not even going to find it. It's not even going to see it. It has to be a dot G code because the G code. Oh, so saving it as a G code is actually the slicing. Is that what? Exactly. That exactly. Okay. Yes. I understand now. That, that's correct. Cool. Saving it. it when a kid, you know, asked me what's slicing, and I said, well, it's just correctly saving as a G code. Yep. And G code is a tool path. So when it it actually says tool path G code, and it tells it tells these motors how to move. Basically, that's what the what it is. G code is a tool path. Um, it's also the same thing that like a CNC machine would use, right? So it's going to be the same kind of type. 
Now, the wheel, uh, is this kind of how to navigate the uh, dialog box that initially appears on the screen when the printer is powered on? Yes, yes, that's how you navigate the screen. Yeah. Okay. But you're going to twist it and click it in order to navigate through this. Just click once to select something. Right, to right. right. Cool. So you have the SD card in there. And so now we're just basically going to go over like troubleshooting steps uh, because we're done with the design and make plans, right? So we designed, we sliced it. Now we transferred and all we would have to do is print. But since we're kind of setting it up for the first time, we're going to go over troubleshooting stuff. And there's four steps to the troubleshooting. Uh, so the first one's going to be Cura, and we want to make sure the Cura things are right. You make sure everything's good on that end. And since we just been through that, we're not going to do. That. I have a question, real quick. Uh, when I'm looking at the printer, uh, if I'm, should I be looking at bottom to top facing the NWA 3D uh, platform, or should I be looking at it from behind? Um, so, so you can look at it like this. Okay. So I'm looking at it the screen. Yeah, so the screen's gonna be like towards you. Right. Yeah. And so that's gonna be like how I'm kind of had mine sitting. It's kind of like this is towards me. Um, and that's kind of how I go through this. I'll try and uh, move it more towards you so you kind of get like. Oh, it makes sense. It's like, so if someone that wanted to come up and do the print job, I only would be looking at it and that I just describe by looking at the. Right. Then right. Angle. Okay. So what we're going to do now is we talked about Cura, and Cura is kind of the first troubleshooting step, make sure everything's right in that program. The second one is going to be a mechanical inspection. So like if something's not making or, you're, or it's making funny noises and it's sounding like a dying transformer, you're going to have a mechanical error. It's going to be like a printer's not, or motor's not plugged in, or a limit switch is not plugged in, or something like that. So we, we, have, we have four motors and three limit switches. So let's take a look at those. We're going to have an X motor here. Okay. And then a limit switch here. That's the close to each other. So that's going to be your X axis. And then we're going to have back here, this is the motor that doesn't have a limit switch. And this is called an extruder or E. So also notice that it kind of has little tags on them that say what they are. Okay. That's going to be E. And make sure that guy's plugged in. And then we have down here, we have Z, which has the big spiral coming out of it. Uh -huh. Z limit switch is kind of hard to see, but it's going to be right inside here. I can see it's like right behind your screen. And so okay. you just have to make sure that's kind of plugged up in there. That one usually doesn't come unplugged. So. And then finally, we're going to have our Y axis, and that's going to be here in the very back. All right, I got it. And it's just going to have the plugs right next to each other. Got it. So all of those should be plugged in. Next thing we might want to check is make sure our belts are a little bit tight. So like if I move this, we want to make sure the carriage here moves. If I spin it from the outside, we want to make sure that this isn't too wobbly, this big arm or the x-axis arm. So if it wobbles a little bit, that's okay. Um, it's not going to hurt your print, but we don't want it to be like super wobbly. If it's kind of like, if you feel uncomfortable about it, then we can, we can address that issue. No, it's, it's great. It's really sturdy. It should be pretty good. The carriage should be tight. So this area should be tight right here. And then, you know, the belt also down here that's using the build plate that moves this back and forth should also be done. And that's kind of a general inspection of our print, right? So that'd be troubleshooting step two. Now let's go ahead and move on to the third step. That's going to be leveling the build plate, which pretty much like takes the longest time. Um, but I think me and you can get through it pretty quick. Um, so what we're going to do is uh, we're actually going to level which is the only piece that gets really, really close to the build plate and the only piece that is hot. Uh, so we want it to be a total of 200 microns away from the build plate. So the nozzle is 200 microns above, right? So what we're gonna need to do that is we need a piece of paper and you can fold it hamburger style. All right. Oh. You still there? Okay, sweet. Okay, fold it hamburger style. And if you like want to turn your camera, if that's possible, towards the printer during this. Yeah. Uh, and kind of like, you know, stand on one side of it so you can see the screen and I can see your printer. So I can kind of help you out a little bit more. Okay. 
good. And so hopefully you have your spool holder together. I'm pretty sure your students already put this thing together. It's kind of like that down acrylic looking thing. Yeah, it's good. And so that's your filament holder or spool holder. So there should also be a big nut and bolt like this. Okay. And that just sits on top. That's what your filament would sit in. Uh, I'm trying to find it. I don't really see that right now. Oh, I got it. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. Yeah. And so that's where we take our plastic like this, right? And we would kind of put it through the middle of the plastic, and then we kind of let it rest on those. Yeah, you got it. Sweet. You want me to be like undoing these bolts and everything on this right now? Oh no, they're good. Okay. Yep, everything's good with that. Okay. So we can set, we can kind of set that aside. Uh, it's just uh, showing you how that that thing works. Do I have my uh, computer angled well enough for you to, to see the printer? Yeah, and hopefully you can also see me at the same time. So I can. Okay. Yeah, your printer's looking good. It's just you know this is like really high up is the only difference between yours and mine right now. Okay. Um, so what we're going to do first is we're going to auto home it, or we're going to put it to its origin point. So we want to go 0x, 0y, 0z. Okay. Click on the button once, go to setup, and then go to auto home. Oh, now how do I go back to main to get back and go to setup? No, so if you need to, yep, exactly, you got it. Then auto, you say auto home? Yes. All right, uh, uh, select it now? Yep. Okay. And so you'll notice the printer kind of moves. So it's going to be 0x, 0y, and now it's going to go all the way down to the build plate, and that's going to be 0z. And so this is going to be how we're leveling it. So we're going to level this nozzle to the build plate. So it doesn't matter if, you know, it's, you know, on a crooked surface or something like this, the nozzle is still going to be at a parallel to the spiral plate. So this is kind of like home on like a, a, a UAV or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or where, where it needs to be. Okay, so once it kind of gets there, what we're going to do is we have to go back into setup and then click disable motors. So once it kind of touches down and it stops sounding like it's trying to move, then we can go setup and disable motors. Will this uh, user interface automatically bring me back to the menu options whenever it's done doing its thing? Uh, no, so you will have to click it again. It'll stay at like the status screen, which is that first screen you see. And once you click it again, you'll see all the options. So go back to setup. Uh-huh. And disable motors. Okay. And so whenever you tell it to auto home, it locks all the motors because usually it does this right before it prints. And so now you should be able to like move your build plate back and forth like this. Yeah, and it's free, right? So it's, it doesn't have a whole bunch of resistance or anything like that. That's what we were kind of looking for. So yeah, let's go. I really like this video conference and the way that you all have this set up. Like it's very, very well structured and everything. I, hey, that's an awesome. I'm glad you do like it. I, sometimes I'm messing up the whole time. So. No, I mean, I do it in class. So the only thing you got to do is just rebound from it and make a learning experience out of it. But this is great. Yeah. I'm learning a lot and I feel, I feel more confident being able to help my students after this. So. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay, so what we're going to do next, we're going to take our piece of paper that we folded and hide it underneath the extruder. So maybe push the extruder assembly, this kind of fan part, and push it over into the build plate a little bit. So you can actually, yeah, you can, exactly. And then we're going to take our piece of paper and we want to push it underneath where that nozzle is touching the build plate. So if it's, if you can't quite get it underneath, what you can do is you can actually push down on this, uh -huh. this build plate. So if you, if you look here, this is actually on springs. Oh, okay. A bit. And that makes it a lot easier to put it underneath. So like if you can't or if it's too close or something, that's a way. It's really easy. I can I can move it freely under there. It's not catching or anything. Yeah, so if the paper is like free and it's not catching and you don't feel any resistance, that means it's too low. Um, so what we're kind of looking for is if you were to take this piece of paper and you were to put your finger on top of it like this, uh -huh. move it back and forth. Right that you have without the paper buckling like this or without the paper being too loose like it feels too far away you want to feel that resistance you want to have a certain amount of it and it's just going to be a small amount of tension and there's not really a good way to give you that same feeling except just whenever you're kind of using it on the printer man 
I honestly don't feel like there's hardly any resistance or maybe not enough. I don't know. Okay, cool. That's the thing that we're going to adjust right now. Okay. I'm going to kind of pick up my printer and move it around and stuff. I would prefer you to keep yours on the table to level it correctly. Um, I'm going to do this for kind of demonstrations, but if you look in here, you'll notice that in between the screen and the build plate, the Y axis, we're going to have a little knob right here. Okay. And so what that knob is going to do is it's going to either higher or lower our build plate. So the first thing we want to do is we want to put our nozzle, this little piece that you can see right underneath here. Uh -huh. We want to put that right above that nut. And so we'll move that over and we'll put it right above it. And that's where we want to feel the level of our paper. So that's where I want to put my paper underneath. Oh, oh come on now. Now, if I can read the uh, NWA 3D uh, yellow sticker, am I looking at the right angle to see this knob that you just showed me? Yeah, yeah, you sure are. So it's almost right above that. Okay. So if you're kind of looking at it like this, as I have it right above it right now, uh -huh. it's actually right inside of there. Okay. Yeah. Do you mind if I show you what I'm looking at so you, I can have confirmation I'm looking at the right thing? Yeah, sure. Is it? right here yeah that's it it looks like a spring though right exactly that's what we're going to adjust oh okay gotcha all right cool yeah yeah so it's it's a knob on the bottom and then above that is going to be the spring in between the build plate and the basic you know the black piece that you see and so what we're going to adjust is actually a triangle that levels the build plate and makes it flat Okay, so once you see it and once you have your paper underneath there, mine's too loose too. It doesn't feel like there's any resistance. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go clockwise to go up. Okay. To say clock up, count down. So if I'm going this direction, right. if I'm kind of spinning it this way, it's going to go up. If I spin it this way, it's going to go down. Okay. Yeah, I'm very spatial on that too, so I, I, that, won't, that won't be able to confuse me when I'm telling my my students that yeah so it's clock up count down clock up count down that's perfect that's a good way to remember that so i'm going to move mine up so i'm going to go clockwise and you know you should only have to do maybe a quarter or an eighth of a turn usually do i need to turn any of the other uh knobs or just this one so just this one for now, right? So what we want to do is you want to make sure that this assembly is directly above it so that we get that level for that spring specifically. That still feels kind of too loose. Yeah, so what you want to do is pull that back out and then go clockwise. And then slide it back and check it again. It still feels... Yeah, it still seems like it's too loose. Yeah. Yep, see now it's now, now now that's too much. Now it's too tight, right. So you, you don't have to adjust it too much. Usually I like to say like a quarter to eighth turns. Eighth turns once you feel like it's close and then quarter turns if it's far away. Right. I mean that's good that I just kinda got you know, that's how I'm kind of impatient in some ways, like a kid, you know, like I think, oh, I got to do all that, you know, and that's what people need to experience first time that they do this. So, you know how to adjust yeah. the ways. I feel like that's pretty, I'm going to stop moving the plate and just move the paper. It feels pretty good. Yeah, if you feel happy with it, if you have like a certain amount of resistance, but it's not like buckling the paper and stuff, then I'm happy when you're happy. Okay. Just so yeah, try it one more time now you adjusted it. Make sure that you push the build plate back to where it's on top of that knob that you adjust, right? Yeah, there you go. Good. That's way too tight there. See, I can even get through it, okay. Yeah, so th in that case, you can actually push down on the corner of the build plate and then slide your paper underneath. Yeah, exactly, you got it. Yeah, that's, that's too much, probably. Yeah, if you feel like it's too much, you adjust it. Yeah, excellent. Uh, sorry, I'm just talking myself through. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This is kind of like a self thing. You kind of have to feel it for yourself and do it for yourself. Otherwise, it doesn't really make sense.
And that's why we do this like really hands-on training kind of thing. Man, I apologize for just. Oh no, this is a whole part of it. I'm like Austin Powers getting stuck in the, the basement of the <laughs> in with the golf cart sort of thing. All right. All right. <laughs> yeah, like he keeps doing that 20 point turn. Yeah, that's what I feel like right now. I'm like that movie guy. It's such a good job of conveying emotion a lot of times in instances, you know? Yeah, this is uh, just a process. So we do this paper troubleshoot every time before we print, correct? No, nope. you do not have to do this every time. So if you're going to move this printer around a whole bunch, and so like if I were to take this and I was to go put it in the other room, I would probably want to check it and level it again. But if I'm going to leave it in the same spot, kind of in the same area that it's been in, you don't have to level this every time. I would do this whenever you find like it's having some issues or something, or like if it's warping up or if it's, you know, becomes spaghetti or something of that sort, that's going to be, you need to level the build plate. Um, and so you shouldn't have to do it every time. This is more of like an initial setup. So we're almost like setting it up for our next training tomorrow with your kids. So maybe what you might want to do is kind of like mess with the knob so it's not level anymore. Gotcha. I like that. Yeah. And so I can go through it with them again. So it'll make, you know, kind of make sense for them like this, like this trial and error that you're doing right now, it's helping you a lot to learn what's going on. So. Right. Now did, how, did they, they didn't get this far yesterday, did they? No, we, we finished Kira and we were about to start this. Okay. Well, I like being ahead of them now because I had enough time, whereas they really didn't. Yeah. So after this, we're going to level the build plate, and then all we have to do is talk about filament issues, and then we can kind of print. So we're approaching like that hour mark. I don't know what your time restriction is. Right? I'm good. I got like an. Hour. I'm on. We're on block scheduling. And yeah. I have. I mean, I don't have another class till one fifteen, but I mean. The awesome. Awesome. No, that's that's great. Yeah, I will stay with you until you know we finish this. Until you're printing and ready to go. Okay. All right. I'm good, man. I think we're level. Okay, so we're level on that side. Yeah. We got two more to do. All right. <laughs> now, what we're going to do is we're going to take this and we're going to push it out to the side here, right? And then we're going to make sure that it's over this one right here. So these are a lot easier. Okay, yeah. So, so I made you do the hard one first is really what I tried to do. That's fine. And so we're going to move it and we're going to make sure that nozzle is right above it and we're going to level all over again just like the one we just did. So it's going to look a lot like this if you kind of want to look at the side view of it. You can see the nozzle that's almost touching and then you can see the nut right here. And we're going to level it the exact same way like you're already doing. And so mine is not quite... And these go in a lot faster. <laughs> but that, that's understood. I mean, that, that's, it's supposed to be like that. So. Now I just need to move the plate to get to this other corner where the other spring's at. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, my, I think it'd be cool eventually if we uh, – I guess there's no way to – that'd be so cool if we could, like, make our own custom uh, platform or plate in the future, like once we got a lot of print jobs under our belt in this class. Not that we'd want to get rid of the NWA 3D, but it'd be cool to have our school logo and like East or something on it. Yeah, so you could actually probably order something like that that's already printed. The thing about these build plates and the reason why we actually have these fold, this piece of paper folded in half is because these actually are a microscopic build plate that helps to adhere to the plastic. So you see how it says lock build on it and it says 3D build surface? That's pretty much who actually makes it and it helps to adhere the plastic to it. So. Like if you ever print and you don't have a very good surface to adhere to, what it's gonna happen is during the print time at some point, it might pull your object up and it's gonna completely fail your print and turn into spaghetti. Uh, so no more hairspray or glue sticks. Right, don't use that. <laughs> Yay, okay. It's, it's, you don't need it for this and you shouldn't need it for this and you shouldn't even use it anyways. If you, if you feel like this lock build's no good anymore, you feel like it's ran out of its lifetime, what we recommend is doing is putting uh, blue tape on like this fiberglass, right? So if you were to like flip this over, so you can take this off, there's just little binder clips on it. So you can take this off, right? 
And we would recommend that you, like if you feel like this surface is done, it's dead, we recommend flipping it over and putting paint, blue painter's tape on it in order to you know, create a new surface. Um, you're also going to have to level it with 100 microns instead of 200. So we do the 200 because this is so sticky. Uh, and then you would do 100 if you're using painter's tape. Nice, man. Okay. Yeah. So, good sure that so we do need to level it with that thing on, otherwise it'll be way off. All right, I think I feel good with all three now. Awesome. Okay, so if you feel good, then I'm happy with it. Next thing what we're going to do is we're going to basically preheat it. And so what you may find is that if you looked at your nozzle, there might be plastic on the tip of your nozzle. And so what we ended up doing is we leveled the nozzle plus the plastic to the build surface. So for this case, what we're going to want to do is we want to heat it up and kind of knock that plastic off and double check our level to make sure everything's good to go. Okay. And so we're going to hit setup and then we're going to hit preheat PLA. And we can go ahead and click on that and it's going to warm it up. So here on the status screen. Mm -hmm. I'll see it. Yes, sir. We have 220 up here at the top. And this status screen is actually going to tell us 220 wants to go to. And uh -huh. the value is what it's actually at. Gotcha. Okay. And then we're going to have this XYZ big white bar kind of in the middle. That's going to tell you where the printer is going next. And then it says NWA 3D A5 ready. And we have this big kind of bar, empty bar. That's going to be your zero to 100% bar. Uh, that's telling you like how long you have free print left kind of idea. And then the little dash dash colon dash dash. That's actually going to be a time. And that time is going to tell you how long it has been printed. Okay. Cool. All right. And, then the, and, everything. and basically, we're going to do that level process just one more time. So let's make sure that it's at zero. So let's auto home one more time while we're waiting. And it's going to go zero, zero, zero. And there's still another thing we have to do when we auto home because it locks something. Locks the motors, so we got to disable motors. Perfect. So disable motors so we can move it again. And then now it should be pretty close to heating up. So mine's at, yeah, 190. So we can put the paper back. So this is going to help knock off the stuff. And then we just, you know, we're going to feel it again. We're going to see if it feels right again. And so mine. Is it, it's a, I mean, it's obviously not the, the plate that's heating up. It's just the tip of the extruder that's heating up, right? Yes, exactly. And that is the only thing that can burn you. So, like, if you touch this shan, uh, the shield fan or whatever, this, you can, you can touch it everywhere. It's not hot. Yeah. On every side. It'll be fine. Yeah. So, yeah, you're not going to hurt yourself. By well, I know, like, I, you know, that should be implied to anybody, you know, but I want to be sure that. Uh, know that and you know really yeah, so I'll show you the only piece that gets hot or is going to be right in here so you can you see that little yellow uh -huh. tape kind of deal so I have my printer turned all the way around that yellow tape in the nozzle itself those are the only two things that are gonna get hot and you're gonna have to stick your finger all the way through the back in order to touch it. you gotta be trying to do that yeah, you have to try to burn yourself on these <laughs> Now, if I'm noticing some scratch marks or what looks like maybe scratch marks on here, yeah, would that is that a bad thing? No, that's all right. This this build plate I have has tons of scratch marks. It's just part of 3D printing and trying to pull the build plate up and off. Does that mean I'm too close to it if it if there are any scratch so marks? So if it keeps making new scratch marks, yeah, it might mean you're just you're just too close. Okay. So if it does make new scratch marks every time you move the build plate, it means you're too close. Okay, so we're going to hot level it now because we're nice and hot. And that feels a little bit too close on mine, so I'm going to lower mine a little bit. And so it might feel a little bit different on each of your sections. Just We just want to double check here what we're doing. So I'm going to move over now, and I'm going to check this one. So we're doing the exact same thing that we did prior. Happy with that one, and then now the back one. All 
All right, I'm happy with mine. All right, I'm on the uh, last last one. Cool, sounds good. Yeah, eventually I'll get the kids to realize like, hey, you can move it as you're tightening, counting down or counting up. You know, I'll be moving your your paper as you're Yeah, down. exactly. You kind of want to do it at the same time so you can get the feel of it while you're moving it. That's real time. That's good. They'll know that. Cool. And now, so what you feel comfortable with it looks like? Uh, yeah, I'm good. I mean, best I can tell so far, first time around. <laughs> yep, so just unplug it this time. Okay. And so just, yeah, just pull the power cord out. This is our fail safe on these printers. So you can always just unplug these printers at any point in time and it's going to stop the print. It'll start cooling down and it's not going to hurt it in any way, but you will have to restart your print. Okay. So if you lose power, you do have to restart your print on these guys. The reason I did unplug it is to show you one, the fail safe, but also two, if you have filament inside of it, it's not moving or printing and it's hot it's gonna create clogs. And so this is a way to kind of avoid that. So like if you see your printer sitting there and you come over and it says 220 degrees up here in this top corner and it's not printing, unplug it as soon as possible. Because okay. what happens is that nozzle, you know, you're gonna have plastic going into this nozzle idea. And if you have this nozzle super hot, when this plastic just sits there in there like that, it's going to become a big piece of black carbon and it's gonna become a clog. And then you won't be able to extrude anything. So that kind of idea that it's in here and if it's hot, we want to just make sure it cools off. And so that's all that is. That's trying to prevent a filament issue, which is kind of the next part we're going to talk about. Okay. Now that we're done leveling build plate, we need to talk about filament and stuff that can happen with the nozzle. And so that's the, that's the first big one. You don't want to make that kind of clog. Now, so we can go ahead and plug it back in. And so the good way to prevent that is obviously to, you know, not clog it. So we're going to preheat one more time. Since we didn't really have the filament in anyways, it doesn't matter. But now we're going to go to setup and we're going to preheat PLA. Now there's also something under preheat PLA called preheat soft pool when you're in that menu. So what preheat soft pool does is it heats it up to 100 degrees Celsius instead of 200 degrees Celsius. And what that kind of means is that we want to take it from a room temperature and bring it up to that 100 degrees Celsius because it makes it a transition state. So it's going to make our plastic in between a liquid and a solid, and that's going to be when at 100 degrees you can actually pull out the plastic and help to remove any clogs that may be in there. Because okay. it kind of joins together in that transition phase, and then you pull it out at 100 degrees Celsius and it's going to help to unclog that. And you can do that multiple times to make sure that it's unclogged if you do have that issue. I have a question. Yes. Even though it says PLA and that's a type of filament, whatever we set in, in Curia that we set the uh, temperature at on it, say I increased it or decreased it in yep. the for a new print job and I go to click, uh, I go to set up and go to preheat PLA. Yep. If it's a different type of filament, as soon as I hit that preheat, it will take it to the preset uh, temperature that I put in Curia or Cura, right? So what's going to happen is preheat PLA is the firmware for these printers. So it's always going to take it to 220 degrees. Okay. You don't want it to be that when you click on the print job, when you click print from SD and click that specific file, it will print at the temperature that you set it at. Okay. Does that make sense? It does. But do I need to uh, pre uh, preheat the print job regardless of what temperature it needs to be? And no, you do not have to preheat. So like if you, if you already, if you have your filament loaded, it's already kind of ready to go and it's, it's still from zero, it's, you know, room temperature or whatever it is. And you click on that print job, it's going to heat to the necessary one. And so it's going to do it automatically. That's we don't need to do that. We're just doing that now because it's just now got out of the box and we want to make sure it gets up the temperature and, and, and right. put it up to that right. temperature. Well, what we're actually about to do is we're going to load filament. And so that's why we're kind of preheating it. Gotcha. Yeah, so we're going to actually push filament through to make sure that everything's kind of working. There's no clogs or anything. Okay. Okay, so the next step now, we're going to move the Z-axis up. So we can either do that with our hands or we can do that with control. So if we, you, we you click want me to preheat oh. PLA right now or preheat soft yeah. pool? Go, go preheat PLA. Soft pool is just another way to fix yeah, transition. It. Okay. So go ahead and hit, hit preheat PLA, and then we're going to go into controls. So click on it once and click on controls. Like this, inter I mean, this interface is really cool. I like it and the knob and, and all that. Yeah. Right? 
Is and then click move axis once we're in controls. Okay. And so, in, sorry, in that previous screen that you saw, did you notice that it says nozzle speed and flow? Right. So if you, in this case, and you didn't pre put preheat or anything so far, it would say uh, the nozzle would say zero degrees or zero degrees Celsius. So if you wanted to heat it to that specific temperature that you were talking about, you could do that here. So you can actually select this value and I can move this up or down and change it. So like I want to change it to 210. I don't want it to preheat to 220. I just want it to go to 210. Okay. So I, I changed it to 210 and if I go back to my status screen, it's going to tell me that it wants to go to 210. Okay. So this is a way to do that kind of preheat idea without going all the way to 220. That's yeah. that specific setting that we loaded onto here that preheats BLA. Well, would it be, I mean, whenever that particular file that I load from SD, say it's 210, will it lower the temperature from 220 to 210 after I preheated it once I uh, print, yes. print, did the print job? Yes. Okay. Cool. Man, I just like understanding how this, okay, for some reason mine's going down now. Is it 214, but it was at 220? It's going to vary kind of in between as it kicks on and off the heating block. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. All right, so now we're going to go back into the controls and we're going to go to that move axis that you saw at the bottom. Got it. I'm here. Okay, and you click it once and we're going to go to one, move one millimeter. Okay. Move Z. Now just crank that up to like 20 or 25. And notice it immediately starts moving our extruder, right? Yeah. Okay, cool. So that's kind of the way to do it from our interface here and to be able to move it, you know, if you auto home or something, this is a way you can move it without having to disable motors because you're actually telling the computer itself, hey, move this, do this, right? So that should be good. And now that we kind of have it moved up, we can load our filament because we're preheated and we're ready to go. And now we can just load our filament. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take our spool and yeah, you should have your spool. And you notice how yours is kind of like, sitting there and it's kind of strung out, uh -huh. it's kind of loose, that is something you want to try and avoid. So that's why there's little holes here in the side of this so that you can put your filament through here so it doesn't start kind of like unraveling. Because if it unravels and it tangles, there's going to be a problem because the printer is trying to pull this off of the spool and if it hits a knot or it hits, hits an area that is really tangled and it can't pull it, then it's going to have problems trying to you know, print out that plastic or square. I need to go through the uh, circle or the kind of elongated ones right here in the center. Either, either one is good for you. Um, that is just, you know, storage. So like if you're not using it, that's how you're going to store it. So gotcha. in this case, of course, I'm going to take it out of here because we have to load it and we want it to load smoothly. Okay, so I'll kind of have a string like this. And the next piece that we're going to need is we're going to actually need, so kind of have your little elongated area like this. Yep. And make sure it's in the filament holder, like I have, so it can spin freely as needed. Okay. And now we can take this piece. And so this, this piece here is kind of like gross. Mine's because I pulled mine out recently, so it's kind of a knob. And so I'm going to want to cut that. Ooh. Got it. Okay. I over here, I have some flesh shears. There should be some shears with your uh, toolkit that you got. Okay. And we're going to take those shears and we're just going to cut it at an angle. So, like, if you look at mine, I'm going to cut it kind of steep like this. Okay. And that's just so that it becomes, you know, a nice angle. Gotcha. Yeah, a nice sharp edge is kind of the idea there. And that's going to help us feed through. So that the reason that we do that is so that when we push it through this tube, tube that you see on here, it's going to thread it through easier. Do I need to have my uh, spool angled anywhere right now before I, uh, you know, like in a, like does it need to be facing the? Uh, so yeah, uh, it's preferable to have it on the left hand side of your screen. Okay. Because like if you if we take a look at the printer, you see how we have it here in front. Like you're looking at it. Uh -huh. when you go to the side of the screen that's where you're actually going to feed the filament through. Okay. So how I'm looking at your printer is where the hole for the filament is. Okay, so I need to be over here. Mm -hmm. Okay.
Excellent. Yeah, so in, I'm going to show you just how I'm kind of looking at yours right now. I'm going to show you where that hole is. So that hole is going to be right here next to the big spiral z-axis. You see how there's a trigger and a spring? Uh -huh. That's where we're going to push it through. You see the small hole sitting next to this spiral right here? Uh huh. Oh, yeah, right here. Yep, that's it, exactly. So this okay. is called our extruder, and this is what pulls the plastic through. So now that we have it clipped, we're going to squeeze this trigger back here uh -huh. with one hand, and then we're going to push the filament through with the other. And that releases our tension so that it can push through. And we're going to feed it all the way through our tube. Just keep pushing it through the tube? Yep, keep pushing it until you hit resistance, until you feel like it stops pretty much. All right, I feel like that's okay. okay. And then what we're going to do is we're going to push it a little bit more just like you're doing. Just keep pushing it a little bit. Okay. Now, look, now look at your nozzle. Okay, yeah, it's kind of like white though. Yeah, so keep pushing. Okay. So this is a way to clear your colors. Since we're putting in red, we want to keep pushing until we see red come out of it. So what that white is from, that's actually from our first test print that we do with our printers. Okay, yeah, it's red. Yeah, and so that's how you clear out, that's another way to clear out clogs or clear filament and also change colors correctly. Should it keep extruding right now? So it's going to kind of keep squirting out small little bits just because it has a little bit of pressure built up in the nozzle and it, it's that's just perfectly fine. So what I want you to do is since we kind of have this thing of spaghetti right like this, uh -huh. uh, go ahead and take some of your tweezers that should be in your toolkit and, uh -huh. and pull those out of the way. So we don't want to touch the nozzle, obviously it's hot. And that's just for safe practices because you don't want to let your students know that you can touch that plastic right there. So you can touch that plastic immediately, pretty much. Once you pull it away from the nozzle, it should all be dry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, perfect. Okay, so that was, you know, the filament. So we went over kind of the soft pull and put it through to kind of unclog stuff. And then there's another one that we can do, and that's actually the unclogging tool. So you have a little, looks like a little needle in your toolkit, kind of like this. I have styrofoam at the end of it. And this is, yeah, exactly. That's our little unclogging tool, right? And so what you would do with that is you would move this up like yours is, you know, move up the Z axis or the extruder. And then we would take this and we would heat it like it is and we would pull out the filament. So we wouldn't want any of this in there, but we would take our tweezers and we would take it like this and we would floss up into the nozzle. And that's just an example of how we would do that. So like if you do have a really big, bad clog, this is a way to try and help knock it off. Well, it will, is 100 the highest that Z will go up? Yes. Okay. So I might technically, technically, it does go a little bit higher. You can move it a little bit higher, but you would have to do that on the controls that we went over earlier. So I may want, if I needed to ever do this, I would probably want it to be a little bit higher than 25, so it would be kind yeah, of... Yeah, definitely, yeah. If you move it up to 100, you'll you'll be able to get under there, and it'll be easy. Cool. All right. I feel really confident in this, even... Right Wait, awesome. So notice that we have it heated, it's on, and it's not moving, it's not printing. We need to do something with it, right? So in this case, if we weren't going to print right now, we would want to unplug it and make it stop heating. But we're going to print. So let's go ahead and click on the button again. Okay. And this is our final step. This is number four, right? And we're going to click print from SD. And then let's select the six-sided dice that we sliced earlier. Got it. And then it says heating, and it's going to make sure it's at 220 degrees. And this is kind of the process it goes through. It's going to heat it first. So when you click on print from SD, it's going to heat it to what you set it to in Cura. Then it's going to move to 000, zero, zero or origin point like it's doing. I had to ask if I had to go to auto home on that before doing that. But yep, you sure don't. It does it itself. And then once it auto homes and touches down and comes back up, it's kind of going to remove the plastic. Like if you watch it right now, it's going to touch that corner and then it's going to come back up and pull away to remove that kind of that extra plastic string that it has right now. And then it's going to go to the print area. Do I need yep. to so you don't really have to get rid of it. It should be okay. Um, you can grab it with tweezers if you'd like to get it out of the way. Uh, but we just want to make sure that that first layer is printing correctly. So most of 
the problems, you can see them in the first layer of your print. And if it looks like it's sticking and it looks like it's a nice bead of plastic, then we should be good to go. It looks, it looks good. I just feel like I, it would have been nicer looking at this point had I gotten that out of there. Oh, yeah yeah well i mean you'll it might have the it might kind of like pop off to the side and you can like brush it off this uh build plate you might even be able to be able to blow on it and it able to move it out of the way okay like th that would be something i would probably do personally just because i'm i guess i'm weird like that like i would want to just snatch it at the right perfect time to get it yeah and that's perfectly fine yeah okay so you like the first layer do you think it's going down good yeah, I think it. I think it looks good. I mean, I'll I'll move the computer a little bit because I don't have it plugged in. Oh anymore. no, I trust you. Yeah, if you're happy with it, I'm happy with it, man. Yeah, it's looking good. Sweet. Yeah. Cool. Well, that's awesome. So that was that was it. Awesome, man. So kind of recap: we went over design, slice, transfer, and print. And then for troubleshooting, we talked, you need to check Cura, you need to check mechanical, uh, level the build plate, and then if you have filament issues. And that's it. So when we have something that, once we get it exported from whatever Tinkercad 123 design or whatever we have and get it to an STL, we put it, uh, we then export it and then open it in Cura. Yes. And then we open it in Cura and we make sure that our settings are correct for it based on the filament type that we have. Right, and based on how you want to print it. Uh -huh. Make sure all the density and everything is fine for the type of object and at the stage of which we're printing it, whether it's an initial proof or a final proof and all those other intricacies. Yep, all those good stuff. And then we go to uh, uh, layer view and make sure everything looks okay on it from top yep. to bottom and from zero to 100% completed. Yep. And then save as uh, G code, and then once we save as G code, we're ready to make sure we don't have any clogs over here. Yep, you're exactly right. Okay, man, that was perfect. All right, dude. Like cool. this is y'all have a great program going on with how you you service things and 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 walk people through. I mean, thank you. I appreciate that a whole bunch. So kind of like for the follow up, uh, I'll actually send you an email with that link, like I told you earlier. I'll okay. kind of send you to maybe on shape and Fusion three hundred and sixty because you already kind of know what Tinkercad is. Um, and then uh, if you have any other questions, you're welcome to email me back at that because you have lifetime support and training. So like if you want to do another training in some way, kind of like how we scheduled these things again, uh, you know how like we didn't get the other training the other day, but we scheduled an immediate afterwards. Don't worry about that. I just, I, it just, I have Oh, you're fine. Hey, school days are crazy sometimes. All right. Yeah. And we know that, you know, we're, we're two educators trying to, you know, teach, you know, different people about 3D printing. That's just how it goes. So um, we're also going to do that kind of make up with your students because we ran out of time and that's something we love to do. That's what we're here for. So uh, a lot of I hope y'all grow so much where, you know, you got to start looking at, at other, other, you know, but you can be anywhere you want to be with video conferencing and stuff though. Exactly. That's what we're going for. So uh, also on our page, if you need like a support, if your printer breaks in some way, you do have a warranty. We have a no questions asked warranty right now. So that little sticker, that yellow sticker you saw earlier, uh, is a warranty sticker. Um, that might be something we ask for like, hey, what does your warranty sticker say? So we can reference our files. And um, uh, if you have any problems like that, just send us a support ticket. So if you go to our page and click support, and then there'll be an area to submit a support ticket, your students or yourself can do that. Um, if your students do it, it's going to basically ask for your facilitator's email and their email so that you're CC'd in it, so that you know what's going on between us. Um, and you can guide them through it. So, you know, if something's going wrong, if the nozzle's clogged and they just can't fix it, they, they don't know how, and you don't have time to help them, contact us. That's what we're here for. We'll do a we'll video conference just like we're doing today, and we'll walk them through that entire process. Man, this is awesome. So glad that we're, we're hooked up with y'all now. Like, this, is, this, is, this is great. Awesome. Well, <laughs> if you don't have any questions, Garrett, uh, I think that's the end of it, and we can kind of sign off here. So That's good, dude. Appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. I'll send you a link to this video afterwards, and I hope you have a good rest of your day. Hey, you too, Michael. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye.